So do keep your Bible open in Luke chapter 15. You might have thought that it was a coincidence that um, when we met outside, which was Joe, Lucy, Phil, G, Reggie and I, we met outside in the car park. Um, could I have this tuned down a little bit there, please, Tess? That we have tried to get through the whole of Luke chapter 15, but failed, and ended at verse 24. You know, sometimes when we think about the story of the prodigal son, we can tell the story just as Chris did there, you know, had a son, what a waster, he went and insulted his dad, blew his money, came back, and wow, the father accepted him, the end. But it's not the end of the story, is it? And what we're coming to this morning is one of those twists in the tale that's actually the point of the parables. And I'm going to ask you some questions just as we start this morning. How do you feel when a person who you dislike or a person who has wronged you, if they're a Christian, if that person falls into sin, how do you feel when that happens? I've, I've heard a giggle. We feel, ha, ah, well, that serves you right after what you've done to me. How do you feel when that person falls upon hard times? You know, things have been going well for them, but then, you know, they got made redundant. And, um, of course, we're, we're good Christians here. We never say anything, but inside, thinking, hmm. Sometimes we get even as extreme as when we hear that that person has died. Sometimes we feel that, well, thank goodness for that. How do you feel when a person who you dislike or who has wronged you, on the other hand, gets a promotion at work? That person who's always been mean to you, but they're the one who your boss has seen and has given a promotion to. How do you feel when that person goes on the best holidays and you have to go to Blackpool in a caravan? <laughs> how do you feel when that person is praised and maybe you're passed over? How do you feel when that person seems to live happily ever after and you're carrying on just normally? Well, we're in Luke chapter 15. We're in what I've just said there is actually the point of these parables. But I want us, before we look at verse 25 to 32 specifically, let's remember why Jesus was telling this story. And if you go back to Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, it says that the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. A few weeks ago, we thought about that very hard-hitting message that Jesus brought he said, unless you hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers or sisters, you can't follow me. And we said Jesus deliberately preached a message to thin out the crowd. He didn't change the message, but he let the message do the filtering. A lot of people thought, well, stuff that. But who was left? Who was drawing near to him? The tax collectors and the sinners. Those who were hated because they represented Roman oppression to the Jewish people. And those who were, you know, those who, the sinners, that notorious family, that individual, those people. And the Pharisees and the scribes, seeing this, grumbled, saying, this man, Jesus, receives sinners and eats with them. And this, it says in verse 3, motivated Jesus to tell them this parable. And in the story that preceded where we're going to read today, we saw the heart of God revealed. That God, instead of being happy when tax collectors and sinners get zapped, God rejoices when sinners repent. God rejoices when the lost are found, which really went against what these Pharisees and scribes were doing. They would love those people have been, to have been punished, to have lost their jobs, to whatever. But God actually rejoices to bless them and to save them. And in this climax of the story, we're going to see Jesus not show the heart of God as much, but show the heart of the Pharisees and the scribes. And he does that by this picture of the oldest son. And this morning, I want us to... Just have our hearts open to the Lord and ask, am I like this older son inside? Do I have that same attitude as him? Now, if we hadn't have read the last few verses, 
If we'd have just read from verse 11 down to verse 24, say, how would you have described the elder son? Shout out. How would you have described him until you heard about the last bit? Yeah, well, we, we see that he's bitter in the end, but the start, compare him to his younger brother. He's faithful, yeah. Younger son says, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me the inheritance money now. I'm off. Older son stays put. He works on the farm. That younger son, he went off to the far country. Well, everybody in the village knew about him. But good old older son, I wish, I wish, I wish more people were like him. Just honoring his father, working hard, good upstanding citizen. Well, I'm pleased that his father has at least got the older son on board. The younger son had really obvious problems, didn't he? Very obvious. Anyone could see what a waster he was, but not the older son. His problem was hidden away from public view. Until the day when his younger brother came home, that is. And then we see, as Sue said, all that came out of this older son. It wasn't very pretty. Do we have the same attitude as this older son? We're going to ask that question, and if the answer is yes, which I think to some degree we all struggle with, then we're going to learn how to deal with it as well. And I pray that we will be a people who are transformed by the grace of God, and that we're characterized by it as well in the way that we treat others. So, looking from verse 25, don't simmer but celebrate. Don't simmer, but celebrate. Verse 25 says, Now the father's older son was in the field. He'd been in the field all these years, working hard in the sun, digging and watering and harvesting. And as he came near and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And you know about the Middle Eastern cultures, particularly Jewish culture, they celebrate. They know how to have a party. As he gets closer, he hears the liars, he hears them dancing, lie, 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 lie. And he thinks, oh, I didn't realize we're having a party today. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. What's all this about? And he said to him, your brother has come. Bless this servant, I'm sure he expected a different response. But he says, look, your brother's come and your father's killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. And then the elder brother's face fell, face like thunder. He was angry and he refused to go in. Don't simmer, but celebrate. Why was this older son angry? Shout out. Why was he angry? Didn't think it was fair? He's done all the work. He's jealous, yeah. He felt that his father's gracious welcome of this younger son was an insult to his obedience, to his faithfulness. He was angry and he refused to go in. I think recently we talked about this, maybe on a Wednesday, but we asked the question, is there a place for anger in the Christian life? Um, well, the answer is yes and no, as sometimes is the case. Is there a place for anger in the Christian life? Well, there's righteous anger, isn't there? Which is a very christian kind of thing to say. But what that means is anger for the sake of others' good and for the sake of God's glory. That, that is okay. You know, that kind of anger would see um, injustice on, you know, like a, a higher scale or even personally. And you'd be angry for the sake of justice for that person. Or, you know, you may see somebody who is just railing on the name of Jesus. And there is an anger that comes. Such anger is justified and can move us for good. But we need to be careful that it doesn't turn into an unrighteous anger. And what that is, is being angry when my feelings have been hurt, basically. Now, what kind of anger did this elder son have? We know. Unrighteous. The elder brother, old, excuse me, the eldest son was angry about what he hadn't received. He'd done all the work. He was angry about what he hadn't received and what his younger brother had received. That anger is dangerous. 
if I have this attitude of an elder son, then I will just be concerned about me and what I've done to deserve. I've done all the work. I was here at 7 o'clock this morning laying out the chairs and turning on the heating. I, I don't actually do any of those things, but I'm just giving an example. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, I, I've done all these things and su such and such comes along and they get all the attention. That's the attitude of the elder son. And carrying this kind of anger, I had this picture come to my mind this week. It's like carrying a big, heavy cardboard box around with you, like some of those at the back. And it's filled with all kinds of stuff. It's heavy. And you're carrying it around. You can't really do anything because you're holding on to it. You're nursing your hurt feelings. C.S. Lewis said that the, um, the serious business of heaven is joy. And when you're carrying this big, heavy box around, well, you can't fit through the door of joy because you're so concerned about, well, I didn't get this. Urgh. This person got what they didn't deserve. <clears throat> and it might be that you're carrying this big, heavy box, and then the bottom gives way and it all comes out, and your anger comes bursting out, just like it did with this older son. We can't enter through the door of joy when we're holding on to hurt feelings. I've said don't simmer, but celebrate. You know, this older son, what could he have done? He could have gone into the party. He's going to say a little bit later, I wanted that big fancy beef dinner. Well, if he really wanted it, he could have gone in and enjoyed it. But he chose not to because he'd rather nurse his hurt feelings. Through Luke chapter 15, the words rejoice and celebrate come up over and over again. You've got a, a shepherd who lost one sheep and he left 99 behind. And when he found that one, he gathered all his neighbors and said, rejoice with me because I found the sheep that was lost. Same with a lady who got 10 coins. She gathers her neighbors and her friends. Rejoice with me because I found the coin that I lost. Party, celebrate. You know, when the lost found... When God shows grace, rejoice. The Christian faith is serious, of course it is. You know, we deal with things of life and death, and eternal life and death. But it is to be marked by joy, and the Christian should have that running through him, joy. What we learn through Luke 15 is that God delights to show grace. That father who welcomed the younger son, he wasn't begrudging, was he? when he opened up his arms and he put the best robe on him and the ring and the shoes and he threw a party, he rejoiced to be kind to that son who'd been an absolute waster. And you know, God rejoices when we turn back to him. No matter how far you've gone, if you repent and turn to God, he is waiting and he will restore you. He'll welcome you in as a son or a daughter. God loves to do that. But you know, when we're busy nursing our hurt feelings, we're so caught up with this box that I'm carrying, haven't had, how God hasn't done this for me because I've worked really hard, then we can't en enter into the joy that he has for us in the Christian life. Instead of rejoicing when Heather, I don't know, something really good happens to Heather, or um, when, for example, somebody that has hurt you becomes a Christian and they walk through that doors on Sunday morning, Instead of rejoicing, praise God, that person has got eternal life now. We're caught up with our big, heavy cardboard box. That's the elder son attitude. He was angry and he refused to go in. But let us not simmer, but celebrate. And we'll talk about how to drop the box in a bit. My second point of, of two is that we shouldn't come to the father as a slave. We should come to the Father as a son. So in um, verse 28, it says that he was angry and he refused to go in. But his father came out and entreated him, or, or begged him, asked him, please come in, son. But he answered his father, Luke, these many years I've served you, and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat. You've given him a, a cow, you haven't given me a little sheep, that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. When we're 
when we have that attitude of the elder son, and we come to God the Father like a, a, a slave and not a son. What is a slave's relationship with his master? Depends on the master. Subservient, yeah, yeah. Uh, it does depend on the master, really, actually, doesn't it? But realistically, you know, we've talked about this before, you don't go and do a job. I forget the example I gave. You, you don't go and um, sweep the floor in, in the bus station because you love the floor in the bus station. You do it to get, to get money, don't you? And the attitude of a, of a servant or a slave, it's about performance. It's about doing to get. A servant or an employee, whatever, it's about doing to get. And what were the first words that came out of this elder son's mouth? We haven't heard anything from him thus far. But the first words that come out of his mouth when he speaks to his dad are, look what I've done. Dad, you haven't paid any attention to what I have done. I've done this. I've worked hard for you for all these years. I've looked after your lettuce and I've milked the cows and I've done whatever. When we come to God like the elder son, we come to God saying, God, I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this. And what have you done for me? We've all done it, haven't we? Let's be honest. I'm not going to stand here and do this because I've done it as well. What are the first words out of your mouth when you relate to God? It's interesting, he says, like these many years I've served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat. Now, these words never, um, do you think he never, ever disobeyed his dad? I doubt it, yes, I doubt it. My son is not even four months old yet, but I, I, <laughs> I doubt he's never going to disobey his dad, no matter how good he is. And he's been a very good boy this morning. Well done, Reggie. Um, but you, when we use these words never, we exaggerate our own goodness and we exaggerate the faults of others, don't we? Say husband, wife, never use the words never and always. <laughs> when you get into an argument, you never take out the bins. You always leave your clothes on the floor. Now, that may be the general trend, but I doubt it is literally the case. And when we use the word never and always, it just gets worse, doesn't it? We're boasting about ourselves. I've done this. You never do this. It, it's probably not true. That wasn't even anything to do with what I was saying. <laughs> but we exaggerate our own goodness, don't we? We exaggerate my performance to God. I've always done this, God. And we're behaving like the oldest son. Now, I want you to imagine um, an eight-year-old boy, and um, he's one of three children, and his, his mom um, cooks the tea, and she has to do the washing up as well, and she's fed up, so she thinks, right, I'm going to put a star chart on the wall. Every time my boy does the, the dishes, I'm going to give him a star, and every time he gets five stars, then he gets more pocket money. Now, you come into that house as a guest, and after, after the meal, this eight-year-old child gets up from his chair, and he goes, and he runs the water, and he's scrubbing away, and you might look at him and think, what a devoted child. What an upstanding young man. Look at the love he has for his mother. He loves his stars, doesn't he? And he loves his pocket money, let's be honest. And sometimes when we serve God, we're doing it for stars and pocket money. But the real motive of a Christian, one who's been shown grace, undeserved love by God, is not stars and pocket money. It is love. You know, a slave, the attitude of a slave is what I can get. This is what I've done, you give me this. The attitude of a son is one of relationship. It's one based on love. Serve God. Work hard for him. Use your time and your gifts. But let it be done out of love for God. A pastor called Bill Foote, um, who did serve in Kent, now he's in America, said this, and I want you to remember it. Belief that I've made God owe me anything is heresy. The belief that I've made God owe me anything is heresy. The only thing that I've deserved from God is punishment for my sin. God owes me nothing. 
How can I put God in my debt after all he's done for me, after who he is? You know, what we've sung about in the one is built the mountains and we, we, we sense his goodness in the wind and all these things. What can I do to put God in my debt? Belief that I've made God owe me anything is heresy. And when we come to God and we're like, look God, I've done this, 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 and this, but you've never given me this, we're behaving like the older son. And he says in um, verse 29, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Now, this does seem a little bit strange, isn't it really? Surely dad's going to give him a little, little goat to have a little party with his friends on a Friday night. But whether he did or he didn't isn't the point, really. He kicked off. And I wonder what your young goat is. Well, Lord, I've done this, 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 and this. I've behaved impeccably for all these years. But you've never given me this. What is your young goat? Let me, let me try and give an example. Lord, I've served you faithfully all this time, but still you haven't given me a husband. Lord, I've worked in the church really hard, but still I haven't got that promotion. I'm still in that stupid job. Lord, I love you. I tell people about you. I use my gifts, but I still haven't received that healing. God, can't you see how hard I'm working, but why haven't you fixed my family? I deserve that. Lord, I've earned this answer to prayer. What happens when God doesn't give you that thing? What is the response of the Christian young couple who remain celibate all through their dating life um, and then they come to their, to, their, to their wedding and their sex life is difficult and hard? They feel like they have earned the right to you know, fantastic marital relationship, but then it's hard. How, how do they respond? Lord, I've earned this. Why is it like this? What happens to the mother who works really hard to raise her children right, but then they rebel? What happens to the individual who serves faithfully in church only for his dad to die young? There are some things that are mysterious to us, and God's grace is one of those things. God gives us more than we can ever deserve. And he doesn't give us what we actually do deserve, which is a punishment for our sin. And God is sovereign. God delights to show grace. And he knows what he's doing. And it will work out right, perfectly. My relationship with God isn't on the basis of, I do this, you give me this. My relationship with God is on the basis of his grace. I can never earn it. But Lord, would you give it? God, you're my father. Could I have this? And if he doesn't, then that's okay. Because think about what he's already done. When, when we are like the, the elder brother, we are critical and jealous of others. Somebody said jealous over there. Um, remember in verse 30, um, the older son says, when this son of yours, you can't even call him his brother, he says, this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. When we're all about earning stuff with God and we're not about God's grace, then we get jealous when God shows favor to others. We become critical of others as well. But what my point was is that we shouldn't come to God as a slave but as a son. I want you to see what happens in verse 31. His father said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother, by the way, he is your brother. He's not just my son, he's your brother, was dead and he is alive. He was lost and he is found. The relationship of a father and son isn't based on earning and deserving. It's based on love. And any foundation of my relationship with God has to be on his grace, what he has done. I think it's amazing 
the way that the father responds. In that first part of the story, how does he respond to the younger son when he sees him there on the horizon and he's smelling like a pig and he's dragging his feet and he's worried and he's probably dressed in rags and he's, um, you know, skinny because he hasn't eaten. Well, that father runs to him and he embraces him. He goes out of his home to that son. And when we considered it before, we thought he put himself in danger. That son could have been stoned. But in order to protect his son from that stoning for being a rebellious son, the father embraced him. But you know, the father showed the same attitude to this peevish older son. Where was dad? He was in the party. But in order to bring this older son in, who was standing there like this, the father still came out to him. And remember, this parable was about the Pharisees and the scribes, wasn't it? They were standing outside what God was doing like this. Why is he having tax collectors and sinners? I've deserved this through my great religious performance. But Jesus, even so, in spite of their attitude, in spite of my attitude, in spite of your attitude, still comes out and says, come in. Drop that big box of nursing hurt feelings. He says, son, you're always with me. Son, you're always with me. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, please. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. where it says, keep your life free from love of money, from love of young goats <laughs> and fattened calves, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The father said to this older son, son, you were always with me. When I find myself envying God's grace towards others, being jealous because I've done all the work, not them, when I find myself in that position, maybe let's go to Hebrews 13, 5. Be content with what you have because God has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. God is never going to leave you. And no matter what else leaves you, maybe your success or things in your family or, or your job or money or whatever it might be, then God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It frees us from envy of what we could gain and it frees us from fear of what we could lose. I can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? God has pledged and promised to never leave you, Christian. We sang that song which has added significance to me now that I'm a dad, how deep the Father's love for us. And we sang that line that said, the Father turned his face away. Jesus was, uh, had his Father's face turned away from him so that we need never experience that. If you're a Christian, no matter how it feels, even if it feels like you've been passed over or left on the shelf by God, it's not true. I've promised to never leave you nor forsake you. You're always with me, son. And what else did the, uh, the father say? He said in verse 20, uh, 31, and all that is mine <coughs> is yours. And God says that to you. What riches God has. What, think about all that God owns. Literally, all, everything. <laughs> he made it. But he gives that to you. You know, right now we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Everything we can possibly need in Jesus. And when he comes and when he sets up his kingdom here on earth, we inherit all things. 
The Father says, all that is mine is yours. And so when I'm in this place of being like an older son, remember, all that you have at home. Yeah, you might not have a little, little goat. God might not have given you that husband or that promotion or that happy family or whatever. And it's not to say that he won't, but what has he already given for us? He's given his all, hasn't he? So, what's the point? The point is, we can't come to God through what we've earned, what we've done. We don't do that when we're first saved, and we can't do that as a Christian. You don't grow by your hard work. You grow by the grace of God. You don't receive by all the good stuff you've done. You receive on the basis of God's love. And off the back of that, then I want to serve him. So let us be a people that are transformed and characterized by grace. I'm just going to leave us with a few questions to ask ourselves. Are you a person who's prone to anger? Is it righteous? Is it justified? Or is it selfish and unjustified? Have you been coming to God saying, God, I've worked really, really hard, but you still haven't given me that young goat. You haven't changed that situation in my life. You haven't answered this prayer. You haven't done this in my family. Well, if I'm living that way, I'm going to live frustrated. May you know freedom by living in grace, by walking in grace. I realize that you are only friends with God because of his love. You can't deserve it. You can't earn it. But would you receive it? And if I'm being like an elder son or an elder daughter, you don't have to stay outside nursing your box of hurts. But you can come inside. Look to the cross when you have that attitude of jealousy. And when you see Jesus there and you see all that he's done for you, who am I to say, Lord, I haven't had that goat. <laughs> Lord, how could you do this? When he says, look at what I've done for you. I'm going to pray for us now. God, we confess that we do come to you like this older son. Instead of rejoicing in what you're doing, showing kindness, often we treat that as like an insult to our own performance. God, forgive us for that. Lord, personally, where I think about all the time that I've put in, all the effort that I've made, and then I see somebody else reaping the benefits and not being aware of all that I've done, God, forgive me, I pray. Lord, we can't see 1% of all that you've done behind the scenes for us. But you've lavishly shown your grace to us. You make us sons and daughters when we believe on Christ and repent, coming to you in faith. And God, I pray that we will be a people who are transformed by your grace. That we don't relate to you on the basis of, I've done this, therefore do this. Quid pro quo. Lord, we don't want that. And you don't want that. Lord, let us be transformed by your grace. And I pray that we could show that to others in the way that we deal with them. Perhaps those who anger us and have let us down. God, we want to be more like you. We want to have your heart. Thank you that you rejoice when the lost are found. You rejoice to show grace. Let us Rejoice when you rejoice too. And Lord, I pray for those perhaps who are prodigals, not the older son, but they feel like the younger son this morning. I thank you that your welcome is the same. And may you receive those who come to you in repentance and faith, knowing that you're a good father. So Lord, we worship you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Chris.